Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 14, 2020, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here again this week. More and more of you guys are finding the show once again, so thank goodness on that. If you have any difficulty, if you watch the recording and you have any difficulty finding the show, please let me know. The links work, work perfectly for me, but I, that, I know that sometimes it doesn't work for everyone just like that. So what are we talking about? Well, current market conditions are going to be the main focus this week. Your questions on trading, just so my ADD doesn't kick in, keep them on the slides while we're live here. And then when we get to the live charts, ask about anything you want. Your favorite stock picks for your benefit, so my ADD didn't kick in. Ask about one at a time, so I know which one I covered. And you can ask about as many as you want, obviously. Just ask and hit return on those. But wait till we get the live charts on that, too. So I didn't realize, but... Two or three weeks ago, I said bull, new bull, I guess it's been three weeks. And so that's part three on that. And then I woke up this morning and started playing around with volatility again. And the only problem with volatility is it's it's kind of cool, but you end up kind of sucked into a rabbit hole. So that's why a lot of my time this morning was spent messing around with volatility and I think there's some things that are worthwhile there. You just don't want to get too caught up in volatility, especially as it relates to market timing. And I'll flesh that out in just a few seconds. And there's some other things I want to talk about as far as am I bullish, am I bearish, and kind of pick apart the overall market and look at some of these areas, such as the Russell 2000 versus the NASDAQ versus the S&P 500. And that'll all make sense in a few minutes. That was a disclaimer screen. As I often sum it up, all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I haven't done too many bear market updates lately because the market's been kind of sideways. At least the S&P has. And pretty much everything I've been saying as of late still holds true. So, But do check back often on my website, on the homepage, or under the bear market updates for the latest. Okay, recently I've been talking about volatility, and one thing that's kind of interesting is the volatility curve vis-a-vis -vis the 50-day historical volatility reading has been flattening out. Now, we're going to pick apart this in a few minutes. And in yesterday's stock chart show and in many shows prior whenever i plot a moving average or some sort of indicator and i'm using little air quotes in the air i make the case that an indicator really doesn't indicate anything especially if it's price based which all indicators are i guess it basically illustrates what's going on in the charts and as an example many times i'll look at a chart and i'll be kind of bullish on it and then i was like well let me just throw the bow tie moving averages in, and I'll notice that they've turned over or sometimes crossed over. And then I'll look back to the chart and it's like, well, wait a minute, this chart, this stock or other market has lost momentum. And I didn't notice that right off. And as I often say, you want to first look at the net net price movement. So anyway, we look at this volatility indicator flattening. Well, it suggests that the market is or has become choppy and lo and behold we look at the market and what is it doing yes it's it seems pretty volatile when you come in and it's up down up or down two percent or more but if you look at it on a net net basis where are we now somewhere around 2800 where were we several weeks ago or a month ago somewhere around 2800 and you can see we're kind of bouncing around the range so that's one thing that volatility is showing now a few more thoughts on volatility but before we get to that the rabbit hole that ended up this morning in this morning was okay well let's just take a look at various periods of volatility to see how that volatility is coming off and what type of volatility do we actually have in this particular market and that'll make more sense in just one second but as you can see volatility flattening the volatility curve flattening and then beginning to come off quite a bit. By the way, 67 is where we are now. So round number 70 on the S&P 500, which is absolutely ludicrous. I I don't remember seeing it that high ever. 
and we could go back in time and look at some point in time to see if it's been that high. But certainly, in recent memory, it, I can't remember it ever being that high. Now, keep in mind, don't worry about the math on historical volatility. It just gives you a statistical representation. In fact, some people call it statistical volatility of where a market, all things constant, and we know all things aren't constant, will likely trade, okay, given a normal distribution. Well, given a normal distribution is a fancy way of saying that if the market held to statistics. Well, the market is not going to hold to statistics, and the market is not normally distributed, but it does kind of give you a reference. So based on historical volatility, if you get the bell curve out and all that other fancy statistics, if you have a reading of 70%, there's a two-third chance that the market will be 70% higher or 70% lower, all things constant, and again, assuming a normal distribution. Well, things change, obviously, but it does give you an interesting reference as to how much the market has been bouncing around. And we'll pick that apart in just one second. Now, what's interesting is I added this little indicator to my charts, and this is the six day historical volatility rating divided by the 50 day rating. And this is work going back to Sheldon Natenberg. I always get his name wrong. I hope that's right. And Larry Connors, who sort of took that research and ran with it. And then back in the day, back in the late 90s, I went into that rabbit hole of volatility and it seems like I'm falling back into it lately. But there are some interesting anomalies that do occur when you see volatility compress considerably, easy for me to say, you will get an expansion of volatility from that from those low readings. Now, Part of this anomaly could be, as you'll see in one second, just some of those crazy volatile periods coming off of the market. But the market is certainly beginning to compress that volatility nonetheless. And then the other thing is, if we're not out of the woods just yet with this potential bear market that we're in, then we could revert back to that higher volatility mean. In other words, we could see some expansion and volatility. Now, before we get into that, let's just talk a little bit about the flattening of the curve. It means that conditions are changing. Well, conditions are always changing, but we're kind of settling into this trading range, at least so far, in the S&P 500. And obviously, as I said a second ago, an indicator doesn't indicate, it illustrates, well, it just says, hey, you know, check out the market it might be range bound and lo and behold it is range bound and sometimes something like a moving average or a volatility reading will help to wake you up to the fact that conditions are changing and that maybe you're just range bound maybe it's not up maybe it's not down maybe it's just sideways for the time being now as this volatility continues to dry up there is a chance for a large move out as that volatility begins to revert to its longer term mean. Now, one thing that I studied again this morning is although markets tend to bottom on super high volatility and top on low volatility, it's still pretty hard to time off of. Now, the last little bottom was absolutely perfect, depending on what reading you're looking at, which I'll show you here in just one second. But I wouldn't get too caught up in the fact that the volatility sort of nailed the bottom here because it doesn't always work that well. And I'll show you that in just one second. Now, if you do have a, a very low volatility situation, and I came fairly close to years ago publishing research on this or possibly making it a book. So it was kind of an interesting system. And I tested it out in several markets. Bonds comes to mind, but it, it might have been a few other markets, too. And if you wait for a low volatility situation and you look for a breakout in one direction and not necessarily that you want to fade that move, but if that move fails and comes back in, then you take the trade in the opposite direction. That's some of the fruits that came from my volatility research. Although, again, a lot of the volatility stuff can put you into a bit of a rabbit hole. So along the lines of the rabbit hole, this morning I said, 
Well, let's take a look at shorter term periods of volatility, starting with the 50 being the longest, and that's the orange line here, and then looking at somewhat shorter volatility periods. Now, as I've said before, years ago when I was the technical analyst for a hedge fund, and one of the things that I would do as part of my job was to predict where the 30-day moving average was gone. Now, it wasn't that much rocket science. It was basically, I would look back 30 days and see what the drop-off was and see what we were adding in. So along those lines, going back in time, we had all this volatile trading over here, which is still reflected in this 50-day HV. This orange line here is the 50-day HV. So you can see, as I said a second ago, we're up here at 70 in that. But if we look at a little bit shorter term volatility, you can see that this is beginning to implode, okay? Now, there's different measures on this imploding. As I showed earlier, we looked at the six day versus the 50 day, and that's running at about a third. But part of that anomaly is the fact that the super high volatility has come off or is in the process of coming off in the market. So we should see this 50-day reading begin to drop, as you can see, as we drop off more and more of those days. Now, I couldn't stop myself as usual, so what I did was I started messing around and adding in more and more and more volatility readings to the chart and shorter and shorter term periods. And I went as low as a, as a three-day volatility and then I went ahead and put a five day, a six day, a 10 day. And those are pretty much in order respectively from the top going down for the most part. And one thing that I noticed, uh, again, with volatility, and especially if you're looking at one thing I never thought about, because sometimes you're looking at something like, let's say the 50 day volatility, which I have here. So I guess if there's anything of use out of this little rabbit hole I went down this morning, would be that if you look at that 50-day volatility, it might be slow to catch up, okay? So yeah, volatility has peaked now. Well, the market bottomed a long, long time ago. But it might be worthwhile to possibly look at, let's say a three-day volatility, see where you are, and then a five-day volatility. And you can see we peaked on this one here. And then somewhat longer-term volatility, such as the six day volatility is here. Okay, so these are all shorter periods. But what's kind of interesting is these shorter periods just absolutely spiked. And then it turned out to, I'm not gonna say predict the bottom, but kind of it let you know that maybe this crazy market implosion may be coming to an end. Now, I wanna stop short of saying, time off of that because you can't, but I think it, it is kind of an interesting thing to look at. And then you could see as a general statement, obviously the flattening of the 50 is kind of slow and methodical rolling over, but all this other stuff is a little bit more extreme. And you can see for the most part, all these volatility readings have come down significantly. So I think it's one of those things that only matters when it matters. And it's something that we should pay attention to and again, I think you have to be careful not to get too caught up in some of these things such as volatility. Now, let me just show you something really quick. So the point I'm making here is, yeah, it looked pretty good on the last bottom. But if we take a look at, if I just went back in time and found a, a bottom in the market that was kind of interesting, and that was 2003. And you could see that the three-day peaked there, and then all those other volatility readings peaked shortly thereafter or around that time, but the market continued lower. And then the longer term 50-day volatility reading didn't peak until around December. But even after that, and even after that volatility had begun to drop off significantly, okay, as you can see here, almost all, all the volatilities dropped, okay, the market still worked its way lower for a long, long, long time. So if, I think if there's anything to glean from all this, and again, let's not read too much into all this, but let's say a market has a V-shaped bottom like we had lately, okay, where you're going to get a big spike in volatility. So the volatility 
might help you to recognize that V-shaped bottom in the overall market. Now, one thing I'm thinking here is like a bottom versus the bottom. Now, it might help you find a bottom, but you never know until long after the fact, obviously, if it is the bottom. And also, one other thing that's kind of interesting, if you're looking at your longer-term volatility reading, and let's go back to the prior chart for that, you can see that, well, it's finally beginning to top out and come off, but that has a lot of lag in it, okay? So it's maybe look at some of these shorter term volatility readings when the market goes whack or gets whack in the volatility and begins to implode like that. So if you're looking at something like this and you say, oh, well, the 50 day volatility, the orange line is peaked. You've not, you don't know that it peaked for quite a while, okay? So just be careful when you're using any type of indicator like that. And I think where I'm going with that is, Number one, it's in hindsight that it peaks, okay? So you could look at it and say, well, the reading is really, really high. Maybe we're getting kind of a panic type of sell-off here. Maybe this thing is getting ready to be, is a little overdone and due to maybe bounce from that extreme oversold condition, extreme volatility condition. But when you back this chart way, way out and squish, squish it all in, that volatility peak is in hindsight. And the other thing is, those peaks and troughs for the volatility and the index respectively, they look like they line up perfectly when you squish it all up. But if you get in there and look at the nitty gritty, they could be weeks off and that could cost you a lot, a lot of money. So again, volatility is kind of one of those cool things and, and it's fun to play with, but just be really careful if you're looking to time off of it. Okay. Somebody in the Facebook group was asking me, it says, uh, so to drill down your thinking, you've been bearish all the way up and now you're getting towards a top of the V-shaped recovery and you're getting more bullish according to setups posted, or is it more by looking at thousands of the charts, you can tell a change of character, not playing devil's advocate, trying to understand. Okay, so we'll flesh this out in a lot of detail, but the bottom line is it's like, okay, the S&P 500 kind of looks like a retrace rally We've got a weekly sell signal there. So longer term, we've got a weekly sell signal. Shorter term though, to the intermediate term, we have more of a sideways movement as we just saw. So the thing is, it's getting mixed. And also, it's not quite as easy as a switch being flipped. So let's flesh out some of the things that I begin to talk about here, okay? I, I think labels are very dangerous. And if you say, oh, I'm a bull, I'm a bull, I'm a bull, you kind of paint yourself in the corner. And it helps to have some quantitative and qualitative things to help keep you from labeling yourself and, and having that strong bias. And sometimes things can just be a little mixed, okay? So the NASDAQ is doing fantastic. We'll take a look at that in one second. In fact, we'll go to live charts in a few minutes but it's very overbought. The S&P over the intermediate term is up. Longer term, it's still potentially down and shorter term, it's sort of sideways as we just saw. And we'll flesh out the bow tie signals and things like that. I think the Russell is still in trouble. We'll take a look at it when we get to the live charts. And now it has me wondering because it seems like speculation is alive and well, is it a market of stocks versus a stock market? Now, I, I never want to say it's different this time, but I'm wondering is, as one of you guys call them the homies, the people that are at home and, and the newly minted traders and the people just kind of throwing money at this market, bottom fishers and just people going in and, and buying stocks on a logical basis like Zoom and things like that. So, I'm wondering if that momentum can, can sustain itself, but as usual, what is, is, okay? And what I've been seeing with some of that momentum is, some of it has followed through really nicely in some of these areas. And I'm gonna show you those in just one second. Now, the bottom line is, everything I do is set up driven by going through thousands of stocks every day. Now, keep in mind, as a pullback trader, what's gonna have to happen for me to get long side setup. So the market actually, as a general statement, is going to have to sell off. So 
if we're trading a thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, hopefully rinse and repeat, we're not going to get setups unless the market sells off. So it could be a little counterintuitive. The market's doing this. Well, obviously, it's going to put a little pressure in general on stocks, and stocks will begin to pull back. So we'll actually see buy setups here. And let's say the market begins to rally. Well, stocks that are in downtrends, we're actually going to see sell setups, okay? So it's not like I'm bullish because I'm showing bullish setups or long side setups, I should say. It's because A, that's what the database is producing. And I think because momentum seems to be alive and well now, at least on a selected issue basis, okay? So it's worth, and I hate to say if you can't beat them, join them, but it, it's one of those situations where it might be worthwhile. The other thing that's kind of interesting is in the short side, everything happens so darn fast. A lot of times it's hard to get on and at least get on enough. And it can be darn if you do and darn if you don't. But remember we had that slide back in March and the market pulled back a few days and there were a plethora of short, of short setting up. And we got aboard a few of them, but not nearly enough of them. And the thing is with thousands of short side setups, it's hard to jump in and trade them all, obviously. You can only pick a couple and then just go with it. So there's not going to likely be any short setting up anytime soon, or, or I, I hate, let me just rewind that. I haven't seen many shorts lately based on a number of days in the pullback. Now, there's been some deep picture retracements, as I think it was Dakota pointed out, like in some of the stocks that I was short recently, such as these real estate stocks, and that's a little bit outside of the methodology. It's a little bit more bigger picture technical analysis, but that's deep picture retracement, sort of like the S&P 500. And some of these REITs has had me concerned about those particular stocks. But some stocks are headed higher and some stocks still look like they could be in a lot of trouble. So let's flesh out some of these things here. So obviously NASDAQ Composite is going pretty much straight up for a while in here and that's kind of interesting and, and it still looks like a big picture retrace if you want to call it that or a v-shaped recovery and it does have me nervous buying into that but obviously with the market going up as far and as fast as it has and now pulling back a little bit we're going to see buy side setups because what we got thrust followed by a pullback now Keep in mind, one thing that I meant to mention earlier, so remember thrust followed by pullback, enter, okay, stop down here somewhere, initial profit target up here somewhere, that's the idea. And with the market looking like that, at least the NASDAQ, which represents technology for the most part, and a lot of momentum stocks, then obviously we're gonna see setups in momentum stocks, and we're gonna see long side setups, okay? Now, the other thing that I've been seeing lately is some momentum stocks following through and some IPOs following through. And the great thing about IPOs, when you're in a market that's not ideal, like right now, for instance, ideally, you want to see the NASDAQ headed higher. You want to see the S&P headed higher. You want to see the Russell headed higher. You want to see all the sectors headed higher. And then you want to find the stock in a hot sector. And then you want to look at all the other stocks within the sector and see if there's any other stocks that are as hot or you want to confirm they're also as hot. You want to see if there's other setups within that sector that might be worth trading. Ideally, you want everything to be firing on all eight cylinders. But sometimes you end up in a situation where you have these super speculative stocks doing really well. And then the rest of the market's somewhat questionable. Well, like right now, NASDAQ's doing okay, right? S&P 500, a little questionable. Russell 2000, even more questionable. But the good thing that occasionally happens is, number one, in IPOs, you end up with a dichotomy. You have some that go up and some that go down. And the ones, it kind of, it's the old Will Rogers saying, buy stocks that go up, they don't go up, don't buy them. Well, in IPOs, we actually have a little pattern where we're looking to buy that breakout to new highs. In fact, I think on this day was a new closing high 
on that one. And then we had an initial pop out of here, which was pretty nice. And it's pulled back a little bit. It might take off again. I did trade this one. I did get stopped out. At a, I took partial profit somewhere in here. I think it was about five points. And then I got stopped out for eh, better than the poke in the eye on the remainder. But the IPOs, especially when the market is somewhat mixed like it is now, the good thing is the good ones, as a general statement, tend to go up, and the bad ones, as a general statement, tend to go down. Now, I did lose money trading an IPO. I stopped out of one this morning. So it's not like it's it's completely easy at this juncture. There are times in the market, and that's why there's an old Wall Street adage, don't confuse brains of the bull market, where everything just kind of goes up. We're not in that kind of market right now. At least we were. We were a little bit more in that kind of market for a while, but now that s and is beginning to chop around a little bit, the market's beginning to digest its gains and start to think about its next move. I think a lot of people who rushed in and, and bottom picked and all these other things as newly minted homebound traders, I think they're in for a bit of surprise when conditions begin to change. And it's a little humbling too for me, truth be told, you know, you see these guys come in there and do so well, and you try to explain to them, look, you got a tailwind behind you, or as I've been saying, a hurricane behind you. You know, make sure you have a chair for when the music stops and make sure you understand money management. And they're like, money management? What's that? It's like, okay, exactly. Now, the other thing that I've been seeing lately is my momentum list is growing and growing and growing. Now, as a gentleman, in the Facebook group pointed out, maybe it's a, why are you, are you a little too little, a little too late? Maybe, I don't know. But if these stocks don't trigger, for instance, we had one that was a recommendation a few days ago, CATS, and it just continued to implode and continued to implode and continued to implode and never did trigger. Well, no capital is put into harm's way. So we're set up based, and as I said a second ago, as the market pulls back, or you might think it might be rolling over. It might be. We don't know yet, right? It might be rolling back over. Well, as the market pulls back, you're going to get what? Pullbacks on the upside. So that's why you've been seeing some long side recommendations in the service lately. But so far, none have triggered. We might have one that might trigger today, and we'll talk about that in just one second. But in the momentum list, it's kind of hard to read. But I have 130 something stocks that I'm watching and I find that kind of interesting. I probably can clean it up a little bit. But for the most part, most of these should still be in decent trends. So there is some momentum that's happening. If you want to look at some of these stocks that recently took off, which we're going to talk about here in just one second, you can go to davelander.com slash archives and take a look at the services. And every day in my trading service, I put out a list of stocks. And I pick what I think is the best out of those lists, if any. Now, we did back on May 4th, this list is published the night before. So it says May 5th, this was actually published on the night of May 4th. There were quite a few stocks in this list that really took off nicely. Now, I did not, recommend any as official setups and i'm kind of beating myself up for that okay but the point i'm trying to make here believe it or not i do have one is if you take a look at a couple of these in here it looked pretty damn good and then the one for today which hasn't triggered yet there's been some decent look at setups so this is the one that hasn't triggered yet a little unorthodox as far as days in the pullback but the volatility has become so insane this stock doubled or tripled over a short period of time so it is taking a little while to consolidate its gains. And my thinking is it has the potential to go on to make new highs and beyond. Remember, if you're new to the methodology, we're looking to capture that swing trade profit. We're looking to get our stop to break even. And then we're looking to hold on for as long as possible. And I'll show you an example of that when we get the live charts. Now I don't think about it. it, might be a good example. So this is the one for today. I have working orders in on this one. And we'll see what happens. Now, if you go back to May 5th or look at the list at the night of May 4th, a couple of ones on the list I pointed out, PDD. I'm kicking myself in the butt for not taking this one. In hindsight, it looks pretty damn good. 
I think at the time I might have been I might have let logic or the news or whatever creep into my thinking. And again, this is uh, the reason I'm showing you my mistake here is so it'll make me be a better trader. And as I said in the stock chart show, I think good traders or improving traders tend to look at what they could have done better. And fake traders or new traders tend to brag about how well they've done and things like that. Well, I don't want to get sidetracked because if I do, I'm going to spend too much time talking about it. But trading is not difficult, but it's far from easy. Okay. It's not nearly as easy as many claim in their YouTube ads. But before I digress too far, here was another one. Big regrets on this one too. It made a nice cut bottom. It's an IPO. Made a bow tie. Sometimes IPOs come public, die out a little bit, get their act together, take off. And that's actually a good pattern to trade. I call it the fly, die, and fly. And this is kind of a compressed version of that. Sometimes what happens is they'll come public, and for various reasons, without going into too many details, but sometimes they'll come public. Maybe some, there's some initial, initial excitement. They'll go down and bottom out for months and months and months and months and months. And then that first bow tie, after they recover, again, I call it the... I said fly, die, fly. I mean, die and then fly. Now, in this particular case, we could see that this stock sort of did that on a bit of a compressed basis. And the other thing, after it pulls back, it makes like a cup and handle. But the other thing with these IPOs is they do have a breakout characteristic to them. Now, in this particular case, I remember thinking this pullback wasn't deep enough for my taste. But in hindsight, being an IPO with a breakout characteristic, if we can get in on the pullback, then when it does begin to break out, you get that extra excitement of an IPO breakout. And like in the ORIC trade, I traded that as just a breakout in and of itself. I traded that on a new closing high. That's the buy at B pattern. So some momentum stocks have been taking off in here. Uh, I had a few on my radar, but I missed them. <laughs> My wife says, at least it was on your radar. I was like, well, that's not going to put food on the table, baby. But thank you for believing in me. Appreciate that. Now, <laughs> I think I was motivated to come up with this Tarzan speak, which we introduced Tarzan yesterday. And I think it came from possibly labels of bullish or bearish. And the point I was trying to make is good or not good or improving or bad as opposed to saying a switch has been flipped my wife made fun of me when my wife learned italian we took lessons and we, we didn't obviously master the language but we learned enough to get by on and she was really shy about using it and uh she made fun of me because i was i was over there speaking like tarzan you know eat me now hungry <laughs> feed me so in tarzan speak obviously we're in a trading range here and if we break out to the upside of the range that would be good okay in tarzan speak and if we drop out of the bottom of the range circa around 2750 that would be not good tarzan speak okay so I wouldn't say a switch has been flipped one way or the other, but if we do break out of the bottom of the range and follow through, or break down, I should say, and follow through, then it would suggest that retrace rally is over. Now, another scenario would be because the volatility is dropping off. If the volatility continues to compress, as I said earlier, sometimes your first move could be a false one. So if we break out the top of the range and then take out the bottom of the range, that could be the beginnings of a possible big move lower, and then possibly by vice versa too. Now here's the problem, and again, it's kind of mixed. If you, it depends on, on what you're looking at. It's kind of like the blind men peeling up on the elephant, right? It's like, is it a wall? Is it a rope? Well, on a weekly basis, it just doesn't look that good. You can see we have a bow tie down, and I'm not gonna bore you this week, too late, right? <laughs> but as I've said in many, many, many weeks prior, if you take a look at those weekly bow ties, not everyone, but quite a few of them, especially off of all-time highs, 
was the beginning of a bear market. So I think it pays to pay attention to the weekly bow ties. And in Tarzan speak, that's there, there's that 2750 number again. If we drop below 2750, it would be not good in Tarzan speak. If we break above, let's say 2950 and ideally a little bit higher, then obviously that would be good in Tarzan speak, okay? So we'll see if Tarzan becomes popular. <laughs> this is left over from last week. And this is one of the problems with momentum. By the time it gets nice and established, and then let's say the market does in earnest, does turn in earnest, then the question is, will the old leaders become the new laggards? And I think Zoom, and we'll take a look at it in live charts, I think Zoom is in the process of making the mother of all tops, and that might be exhibit A as far as that's concerned. Now, I noticed I said this several weeks ago, and maybe this explains why some people think that I'm bullish now, okay? And that's because I've been saying forever, especially given the nature of the S&P 500 and the Russell 2000, not so much the NASDAQ, obviously, but those other two, as usual, I believe in what I see and not in what I believe. And that's why we're going after some momentum stocks now, because some momentum stocks are setting up. One of them imploded and did not trigger, so that's good, okay? At least you didn't put capital in the harm's way. At least you didn't lose money. You didn't make any, but you didn't lose any. And the other one might trigger today. We'll see how that one shakes out. So I think that's a long-winded way of saying one day at a time. If you are a gold member of DaveLander.com, then I would urge you to join the Facebook group. I think everybody here, or most everybody here live is in the Facebook group, and they'll tell you flat out, it's been a good thing. At least I hope they would say that, because it's been a great thing for me, and I've enjoyed it a lot. And you know, we go back and forth. We don't always agree on everything, and I think that's important. But the, the great thing is, it's multiple eyes watching the screen, and we get some ideas and a little research here and there. We got some things that I've been fleshing out as of late and paying attention to just in case it's a possible new setup that's evolving here, especially given the current conditions. And that's, as we've dubbed it, the return to paradise is what I'm kind of referring to. These stocks shoot up and then come down and consolidate and go right back to their old highs. And I'm wondering if there's something there and i've been pouring through my old books on technical analysis i know i've seen that pattern somewhere and i don't want to take anything away from the gentleman who brought it up because it's something that i've certainly have forgotten about and i think that it might be something that's worthwhile and the only point i'm trying to make there is there's nothing new under the sun it's like i've come up with stuff and i thought i was brilliant and coming up with something and somebody's like yeah yeah uh, so and so did that about 30 years ago or i read one of these old books on technical analysis like well wait a minute this is the same exact thing that i have seen so but anyways it's pretty cool and i'm wondering is that just a function of what's happening now and even if it is who cares we can maybe trade that and, and work through it but that's just one little one little piece of the puzzle that i think we're working on over there and it's been wonderful for me, and I've been pretty excited about that. And I do occasionally throw out some IPOs and some opening gap reversal type of trades. So if you want more information on that, you go to that URL. And a shortened way to get there would be just go to davelander.com slash members and then sign up for a free membership, which will give you won't give you access to the Facebook group, but it'll give you access to a start course and a free market timing course and that's a good way to get started and you'll also be able to access the latest i think it's six or so articles on my website as opposed to just the last couple ones on the home page all right let's shift gears and get to the market you guys want to start asking about individual stocks please do so now and while you guys are doing that let me just walk you through a few things that we may have not fleshed out just yet. For instance, let's take a look. Well, we'll take a look at everything one more time, but let's look at the Russell so I don't forget. The Russell 2000, you could see, as I've been saying quite a bit, has that retrace look to it. And it didn't really retrace as high as the S&P 500, and especially it didn't retrace as high as the NASDAQ. Now, if we were to put in the weekly bow ties, you could see that 
They have crossed over to the downside after almost all time highs and it's pulled back. In fact, it's actually triggering on that, I guess, today. So longer term sell signals are triggering there. So bullish or bearish on the Russell 2000, put a gun to my head. Well, I'm bearish, okay, because it looks like it's kind of rolled over. Now we are recovering from today's lows, which is a good thing, but we're still down a percent and a half plus. And it still looks like it could be in trouble longer term. NASDAQ deposit, as we just said, has kind of gone straight up as of late, and it's pulled back a little bit from that. My big concern, as I've said ad nauseum, is these V-shaped recoveries. By the time you get all the way back to brand new highs, a lot of times the market begins to run out of steam. It's hard to run a race right after you have ran a race. And I hope I got my tenses correct. My poor Cajun English <laughs> hinders me when it comes to learning a foreign language. Can't get the tenses right here. It's, it's even harder to get them right in a foreign country. S&P 500, it looked kind of ugly this morning, okay? But it's off its worst level. It's only down about a third of a percent. And again, we're kind of stuck in this range. Bigger picture, again, it looks like a retrace rally. And again, with the moving averages in the both side moving averages, it still looks like, or it still is, a weekly sell signal there. It hasn't really triggered, let's say, a conservative entry of around 2,700 or so, but it's worth keeping an eye on that the sector action and again here's your dichotomy you have some areas that look pretty good like drugs okay but you still have that v-shaped recovery and they really haven't made a whole lot of progress lately so we got to keep an eye on this situation and again my big my big problem with the v-shaped recovery is the market can run out of steam by the time it gets all the way back to its old highs okay and if you pull back in, then you're kind of in this in this soup. You're in that pre-breakout level or back below breakout levels. And the momentum sometimes begins to, just to dry up when that happens. Biotechnology broke all the way out, came all the way back in. Still kind of hanging in there right above the breakout levels. Looks a little bit better than drugs overall. Now, the thing is, on an individual issue basis, if you drill down into these sectors, there is some momentum still and we'll take a look at that real quick so there is a dichotomy even within the setup so you don't just want to look at the sector on face value you want to drill down within that sector and see what's going on so let's just take a quick look at that real quick i'll sort them by volume dollars now gilead's all over the place but it's, it has obviously worked its way higher and some of the big ones like amgen obviously look like the overall market but if we dig down in here you can see mRNA, look at the momentum there. Okay, that's pretty impressive momentum. VRTX, that's decent momentum. And a lot of them aren't doing fantastic. But quite a few of them have taken off nicely. This S-Gen, that's on my momentum list. Most of these are on, or all the ones that you see that are going straight up on my momentum list. I mean, this is just too crazy here. Obviously, it's it's doubled overnight, so it's something we wouldn't go after. But anyway, the point is when you drill down here, you can see it's kind of mixed within, but there are still some fantastic stocks. So even though I might be a little concerned about biotech stalling out a little bit, when you have stocks that look like this and some of those other ones, then maybe if we see a setup there, okay, even if the market is a little iffy, then we'll take it, okay? So bullish or bearish, maybe I'm bearish overall, but if I see something like, EBS here pulls back a little bit or whatever that was, TGTX. So you kind of see how it could be a little mixed and a little muddy. And, and believe me, this is not an easy environment. A lot of what's happening is unprecedented and we have to sort of, we don't want to change what we do, but we want to adjust as quickly as possible. Maybe we take setups that have quite a few days in the pullback as opposed to saying, well, we're only going to take setups with a maximum of six or seven or eight days in the pullback so we might have to change a little bit without completely you know without throwing a complete methodology out the window now again the dichotomy of the overall market retail v-shaped recovery at high levels beginning to stall out a little bit at those prior highs so we'll have to see how things 
shake out. Health services never did quite make it to its prior highs, okay? So this overall sector looks a little questionable in here, but if we drill down to it, just like we drilled down to biotech a second ago, you'll probably see, or I know there are quite a few really interesting momentum stocks that are in there. Energies, have that retrace look to them on an individual issue basis. I am seeing some bottom out with the commodity related area. Ideally, I like to see a bottom take place over a long period of time. So ideally, I'd like to see something that looks like like this. I'd like to see them go down and just bottom out for months and months and months and just have everybody forget about them. And a lot of supply gets washed out of the system. Tax, lo tax loss, selling, God forbid, death, estate settlement, all these other things. A lot of supply gets taken out of the market. And then when it begins to rally, you get a little cup and handle, a little bow tie, a little first thrust. That's when you could really do well in a commodity related area, such as the energy. Sometimes these, if you want to call them value stocks, okay, such as commodities at low levels become a value. Not that you want to trade them and try to pick a bottom, but when they begin to rally off of those lows, those value stocks can become momentum stocks. I can think of a couple of CNX a few years back was one of those that really took off of lows and there were a few, what, CE and X, or is that a, that's not an uh, energy, is it? What is CNX? and X? So yeah, that was a commodity stock. CNX, I think, is a, is a oil field stock. Those were stocks that bottomed out really nicely over a long period of time. Gold stocks, same thing. I like for gold stocks to bottom out over a period of time. And that just, it's the bigger the base, the bigger the launch in the space, which I thought I coined that term just to show you there's nothing new in the sun. Evidently, that's Ralph Akampora that used to say that. So as you go through these sectors, I won't go through all of them and bore you too much, I promise. But you could see there's kind of a dichotomy. Defense just kind of rallied up a little bit. Now it's rolling back over in here. Manufacturing rallied up a little bit more, and now it's beginning to roll back over. So transports another one of those rallied up a little bit so bullish or bearish i guess overall i'm still kind of bearish okay based on the action in the russell and the s p and defense and transports and a few other areas in here but i am feeling constructive on biotech as a general thought as drugs a general thought at least on an individual basis okay so bullish or bearish i'm kind of it depends on where we're looking, right? It depends on what part of the elephant I'm feeling, right? There's a semiconductor's big retrace rally in here, chopping around a little bit on an individual issue basis. I'm sure my momentum list has some semis in it that might be worth taking a look at. So I guess I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but the market is sort of talking out of both sides of its mouth too. All right, let's open up for stock picks. FIVN. Yeah, this one's on my momentum list. I'd be willing to bet. It looks fantastic, but let's wait for a pullback and let's see what happens, okay? And it's had a pretty big run. What's that, about 100%? Yeah, round numbers, it's more than 65%. Well, from the lows over a fairly short period of time. So let this thing pull back a little bit, okay? FLIR, yeah, keep the questions coming. Okay, FLIR, F -L -I -R, easy for me to say. A little bit different situation. Now, we just look at defense stocks and they're not doing so hot, right? So here's the thing. What did I just say? Ideally, you want the market, you want the sector, you want stocks within the sector all headed the same way. But if you really, really like a setup, then by all means, take it. So strike number one against this is defense is questionable. All right, well, let's let's see if we really like the setup. Setup looks pretty good, but I'm seeing a big problem here. Okay, so we had this nice thrust from below. We had a pullback. There is an absolute mountain of overhead supply. I was reminded a couple of days ago of a story. I was explaining the psychology of technical analysis to someone, and a neighbor called me up, and I think it was GE. He wanted to buy GE, and it was GE was traded at like I forget the exact numbers, but let's just say 16. And I said, well, you know, there's a whole lot of overhead supply right above this market right about 18 to 20 or so and i said if, if you buy this stock your gains are likely to be capped to another two points higher about 18 or so and he's like well i bought it at 18 so it's like 
okay, so he thought it was at a bargain when it was basing metaphorically in this area here, and then it dropped below it. So he's a microcosm of what's going on in the market. Now, he might be looking to get back out at break even. He was obviously looking to average down in his position, which is a horrible idea. But even if he did average down, it still, once again, kind of plays out as far as the psychology is concerned with a technical analysis. So this particular market, you have a, an S ton. I don't want to demonetize my video, but you have an S ton of <laughs> overhead supply. Yeah, I like those guys that are selling all that crap. They actually, they actually pay for my YouTube channel. So I, I guess I can't beat them up too much. Okay, uh, HOLX. Okay, this one looks pretty good, but a little concerned that you have a tiny bit of overhead supply. And it also, it's kind of that V-shaped recovery problem. And usually I don't take pullbacks. I might take a pullback way down here as a transitional setup, setup but I usually don't take a pullback when it's right at the new highs. I like to see it break out to brand new highs first and then look to play the pullback. So on that one, I would pass Lynn, L-E-N. This is a home builder. It's not really jumping out at me. Bigger picture, it kind of looks like a big fat retrace, okay? So I'm kind of, it's kind of hard for me to get excited about it. And you can see it, it is, takes off, it comes in, takes off, it comes in. So I would pass on that. If something like this were to bottom out for a while and then begin to take off, I might be more excited about it. But I'm looking at this bigger picture view and it just looks like it's just kind of a big picture retrace so far. So I would pass on that one. Hey Dave, Kuyan could not make it. Kuyan could not make it this morning. I wanted to ask if 37.5 was a valid entry on Oric. The only thing with Oric now is that the, I'm looking at it and I was just long this stock as I mentioned earlier. And I caught a little pop higher, and then I dropped the nap bomb. And then I realized my account balance, at least based this stock, <laughs> was a little bit higher. Believe me, it's been kind of brutal lately. And I'm thinking, well, it's, it sort of looks like it might be worth trading as a pullback. Now, usually I like pullbacks to be a little deeper. But with IPOs, I'm a little bit more lenient with the setup. So the problem is with this one is that it's the spread is widened, and you're saying 32.75. I think a better entry would be to wait for it to get above this high with a stop below this low. So maybe trade it a little bit like um, like you would a, a trend knockout. I'd actually like to see a little bit bigger knockout here, but I think it's an okay setup. Entry above the high, stop below the low. You can almost trade that in textbook. You're a good guy at asking the question for him because he couldn't make it. Do you have any criticism on the setup? I wanted to ask if TXG was a decent ogre this morning. Thanks, Ed. Let's take a look at that. So an opening gap reversal, or as we call them, an ogre, is when you have a stock that's, you know, ideally, and we we trade these in the direction of the trend, but ideally the stock is headed higher, headed higher, headed higher. You could draw a big fat blue arrow, okay? And then it just gaps lower. And what we're trying to do in this situation is we're looking on an intraday basis to get in when it breaks out of, let's say this is a five minute bar intraday chart, okay? We're looking to play that opening range breakout, which is probably similar to Toby Crable. I think Larry Williams did a lot of opening gap reversal type of trading when he, when he won the trading contest years ago. And it can be a viable strategy. You gotta be careful when you do those day trades though, because Let's say you lose $400 on a trade. Well, $400 a day, that's 100 grand a year. So you have to make sure you actually make some money in these trades too. But sometimes if you get this perfect little, nice little uptrend, you get that gap lower, you will get this reversion to the mean move straight back up. What happens is everybody panics, rushes to the door at the same time. Market maker opens it low because he has to buy that stock from you, okay? And he also likes to make money, so he wants to sell that stock higher up. So that's the idea when you're trading these open and gap reversals. Now, it looks okay, and this is what I wrestle with a little bit. Ideally, I want to see, like, like back here, for instance, okay? Let me see if I can clean up some of this. Well, it might take too long. Like back here, the pullback, it looked pretty interesting. Let's say in this pullback, we had a gap here. So we've got this huge thrust behind us, and you got a lot of people wanting to buy this stock 
it gaps open, it shakes out a lot of people, maybe some shorts begin to cover because they're finally vindicated, and then that selling exhausts itself, and you're looking on this on an intraday basis to come back in the direction of trend. So in an ideal world, I trade the ones, or I like to trade the ones that look like this. So I hear you, it's just not a perfect setup. I like to see a setup that's perfect on a daily basis, okay? And go in and take that little opening gap reversal trade. If you go in and watch the presentations we did where I talked about Cree, if you can't find them in the weekend charts, if you go into Q&A, we have a ton of ogre trades in there. So ideally, I'd like to trade it over here where it's set up, but I hear what you're saying. Let's zoom in a little bit. And this is what I wrestle with a little bit, especially in this given market. Forget about everything off to the left, because I, I wouldn't trade this as a brand new setup in and of itself on a daily basis, okay, with the overhead supply and everything else. Back here, it looked a lot better than it looks now. But if you zoom in a little bit, and you're just trying to catch that day trade, I hear you because, okay, well, what do we have going on? We have a double top knockout, and I'll show you that pattern. Double top knockout is when you a market makes a little bit of a top, it makes another little top, ideally a little bit higher than this one, like we have here, and then you have a trend knockout move, okay? That's a double top knockout. If I was seeing this without the longer term chart in mind, I would be all over that setup, okay? So as it pulls back, I think it's a worthy setup. Unfortunately, though, like I said, longer term, it has some issues. So I hear you, you've got the gap lower and you're looking to play that pop back up. Now let's clean up this chart and take a look at the five minute chart. And maybe I could flesh that a little bit further. Now in this particular case, it worked. Maybe I look for perfection too much sometimes, but you know, this one, this one could have been tricky, okay? And it's not as easy as it looks on the, uh, number one, I wouldn't have taken it, but number two, it's not as easy as it as it might have looked on the daily. So let's say it's like, okay, this thing opening gap reversal here, but sometimes you wanna let it establish itself. It's like, okay, well, we got a little range here. I'm not gonna get faked out here. Maybe I put an entry here, you get triggered in, and then you get spit out down here, okay? And then it works its way high. So that would have been a really tough one to trade unless you would have had a really liberal entry up here somewhere and then you would have just missed a trade. So on a daily chart, it looks a lot better as far as it looked like you could have just made money in a trade and it wasn't that easy. But anyway, long story endless, as I said a second ago, I would have passed anyway on that. I was hoping when we got to this intraday chart that it would look like something over here, a gap lower down here, then immediate reversal and then pop back up. I'm trying to, I can't really, none come to mind and I've traded lately that worked out perfectly. John wants to know about HEBT. HEBT. Yeah, it looks fantastic. The first thing I'm noticing though, look at the volume. It only has 70,000 shares a day volume, which is not much, okay? But yeah, I mean, it looks fantastic. HV's a little whack, but HV's a little whack on everything, you know? It broke out of this wide and loose, somewhat wide and loose range. Doesn't look that wide and loose anymore, does it? It shot up, it made a TKO move right there, okay? People, you wanna know what a TKO is? That's a TKO. Nice wide range bar, bam, down against the trend. I would say entry above that TKO bar, stop right below it maybe. Unfortunately though, man, that's thin and that's dangerous. Check the spread too. So I would pass on that, but hey, good eye and high five as far as a good look at setup. You know, these base breakouts, look at that, a base breakout with a TKO, write that down. It's a good little setup, PRTS. Yeah, that looks pretty good. I'd like to see a little bit more, and this is also in my momentum list. It broke out nicely past all this overhead supply here. I'd like to see a little bit more pullback in this particular case. Look at the HV, 153, like everything, it's just whack right now. So absolutely, James, on a little bit deeper pullback. So I think it was Laurent was asking me about why you're so bullish. And it's like, well, again, I'm kind of mixed and I'm kind of wishy-washy, right? I'm kind of bearish here and bullish here. I see a stock looks like this and I see it pull back a little further, okay? Or whatever that prior one was, even though it was thin, then I'm saying, well, these are some 
good looking stocks to go after in an ideal world i wish that market was behind me okay i wish i had that tailwind still as we did have for a little while there when it started to melt up from the lows but i'm willing to take a shot i'm willing to be bullish on this and still bear somewhere else it's i think they said in, in billions a while back it's okay to have two emotions at one time right which can be a little weird yeah this one looks okay again i'd like to see a deeper pullback my only problem here and initially i look at it i get pretty excited but this whole big rally was just one day okay so i would pass on that one keep it in your momentum list but i don't see anything that's going to happen there right away elizabeth wants to know about mtrn yeah we talked about that one i think if not we had another one look just like it and here's the problem overhead supply okay there's an inappropriate joke I can make about overhead, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so it's about the, the brothel on top of the hardware store. Anyway, I digress. KC? Yeah, here's a, um, this is, this one I was looking at this morning, actually. It's almost too perfect, right? Because it's a cloud, cloud software stock. And if we take a look at like, take a look at like these CLOU, I believe, that's a, one of those cloud computing things, ETFs. I mean, it's got the V-shape issue, but you can say, well, it's definitely headed up and it's definitely pulled back. Take a look at, let's see, WCLD. There's another one, it's one of those cloud things, SKYY for Sky. Not quite as good as those other ones, but you can see those cloud computing stocks doing pretty good. So it's definitely in the right area. Um, yeah, I like it. The the buy it be one of the caveats is that it has to close at a new closing high but also be below twenty dollars a share now i'm a little lenient with that rule i think this one needs to be on your watch list it's definitely on my watch list okay so with our ipo setup we like to buy new closing highs now i came up with a new pattern to this to help me to start decide on buying stocks greater than $20 when they, when they're, it's an IPO setup, is it like a buy at B? And all I'm doing there is I'm adding in a five-day simple moving average and looking for Landry light. In other words, the low must be above the five-day central simple moving average. So by all means, please put this on your watch list. This looks fantastic, but let's just see what happens. It's gonna have to give above 26 for me to buy it. If it would have ran higher, a little bit higher in here, you could argue that it might be worth buying on a pullback. I'd like to see a little bit more thrust higher though for that. So as far as right now, on a breakout above 26, it would have to close above 26. And ideally that low would also need to be above the five day simple moving average. But I hear you, it did make a thrust higher and it has pulled back from that. But I would just prefer trading it above 26 as opposed to trying to trade that pullback but good eye on that john and yeah make sure you guys have that on your watch list hopefully we just paid for your show right <laughs> this one keeps catching my eye but then i can't get past all of this fluff over here and i guess it would be a good problem to have if it got back up here but i'm going to pass on on that one it just has a lot of bad memories to it and then I'm not really crazy when you have a big gap down. Usually a gap becomes an area of resistance. Some people think gaps are closed. That's simply not true. I know some of them are. But as a general statement, a gap is is a resistance area. So I would pass on that one, but I hear you, man. It made a nice thrust higher, a little pullback. I bet you a thousand dollars. It's a bow tie. Look at that. Okay. It's also a bow tie. It looks pretty good, but too much bad memories. Okay, any more? Going once, going twice. Well, while we're in impasse, I want to thank everybody for showing up today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, you can shoot me an email at daviddavelander.com. If you're a member of the Facebook group, I could get to it a lot quicker. So if you ask it there, so just ask it there. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a great weekend. Stay safe, stay sane, and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.